good good morning uh common ground so i had like three other chapel names in my head that i'd been a part of in the past i was like nope that's not it i'll get to the to the right one <laughs> my name is chaplain Amy brand for those uh, of you who are new here i'm one of the the pastors on staff uh just a, a big welcome to you if this is your first time we do have a we do have a gift this is your first time being here if you could just raise your hand we'll come and, and give you just a token of appreciation uh, for you being here uh, and inside that there's a little communication card that if you could just fill that out and put it into the the offering plate as it goes by uh, that would be helpful to us to reach out to you and and hopefully we can have a cup of coffee with you in the coming weeks to see how we can do is there anybody that's that's new in the back anybody we've got we do have a a gift up here <laughs> one in the middle R richard are you doing you have the gifts of that in the back oh you got it family i've got somebody over here on this side welcome to our family uh i hope that your your time with us is is good uh, over on this side over here yeah, yeah. uh next let's see two sundays two sundays from now on the 6th of november on our family sunday uh I, we're gonna have a, a fellowship lunch uh, afterwards um what my plan is i still have to talk with some key people hopefully i'll have dinner with them tomorrow night uh, but what I'm, I'm planning on doing is, is buying some chicken, uh, and then I'm going to ask you guys to, to bring some stuff in for, uh, for some sides and things. So next Sunday I'll have a sign-up uh, for us, I'll pass a, you know, the old-timey clipboard around maybe. Uh, I know there's some fancier ways to do it online, but sometimes a clipboard is nice to do as well. Just to put up some sides so that we have something to eat other than chicken in the back. Uh, but uh, I, they may, that, that plan may change, but I think that's, that's where I'm going with right now since I announced it. I'm going to head it that, that direction. We also have a, a fellowship lunch. I think it's on the 20th of, of uh, November as our Thanksgiving uh, fellowship meal. Uh, it's one of our more traditional ones that we had. Um, we're going to work on that one as well. I, I'm probably not going to be able to do a fully catered one. I may ask for some for more volunteers on some sides for you all uh, due to some budgetary constraints that we are in in our environment. But you're probably feeling that too. So I... Uh, We'll, we'll cover that when we get there, but we'd just, if you'd plan to stay afterwards, those two services, uh, it would be awesome to have and see you and do some more fellowship. We do invite you afterwards. We do have some coffee and donuts in the back, so don't run off too fast. Just say hi to somebody. See how they're doing. See how you can pray for them. Use your spiritual gift. God is calling you to be a minister of the gospel uh, to one another, like you are a minister of the gospel, and God has given you gifts to use inside the, the body of Christ uh, to encourage one another to live a holy life, to live a life of purity, which is, well, I'm going to be discussing a little bit later on in, in, the, in the sermon. But you're a key part of that. And fellowship is a big piece, not just because we're trying to be friends. Uh, but I hope that's a part of it. But also because I'm using my spiritual gift to, to encourage you to be the Christian that God is calling you to be, to live the life that Christ is calling you to live. So that's kind of that's my pick. You know, So drink a cup of coffee for Jesus and use your gifts to encourage one another to live uh, to live for him. Um, I, I will make this announcement before, the, before I get into my sermon. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about sex today. And so if you have littles that you keep in here with you, I'm not going to be profane. I hope I do not because that's going to be against the scripture that I'm preaching. Um, but it is going to be more mature in its content. Uh, so I just I push that out to you. So if you want to check your kid into Children's Church a little bit later on in the service, feel free to do so. Um, you shouldn't have that, it shouldn't be that big of a deal, but I want to put that out there because it'll be a little bit more mature than normal uh, of, my, of the sermons that I give. Uh, without that, I think that's all my particular announcements. Again, it's good to see you here. I hope your, your hearts are prepared to worship God fully uh, in, in song and in listening and in the, the proclamation of His Word. Good morning. Happy Sunday. We we'll welcome you all to this wonderful worship service. So this morning I will be reading from Romans chapter 8 verses 35 to 39. So let us go to the Lord all together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
Not in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unfailing love. Thank you for conquering death through your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may have life. This morning, we humbly bow down our heads to you in our praise and grateful hearts. Come down to this place, Lord, and take your place as our Lord and King. In your Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. If you please stand as able and sing with me hymn 45, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown Him with Many Crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns A music but its own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And tell him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, all hell, redeemer, hell, for thou hast died for me. Thine praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife, for thus he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given from yonder glorious throne. To thee be endless praise, for thou for us hast died, be thou, O Lord, through endless days, adored and magnified. Now please turn with me to him 545, five, moment by moment. <laughs> Dying with Jesus by death reckoned mine, living with Jesus a new life divine. Look 
looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I live from above, looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Never a trial that he is not there. Never a burden that he doth not bear. Never a sorrow that he doth not share. Moment by moment I'm under his care. Moment by moment I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I fly from above, looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Never a weakness that he doth not feel. Never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment in war, in will, Jesus, my Savior, abides with me still. Moment by moment I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I fly from above, looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Please be seated. Let us continue our worship service with our tithe and offerings. Let us all stand up for doxology.
Uh, this time we're going to have time to pray. Uh, we all have always uh, things to bring to God. So without faith, we cannot bring them to God. When we have a faith in God, when we know God cares for us, we can boldly bring our needs and concerns to God. So in silent prayer, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your faithfulness and unfailing love. You always stay when we need you. You always save us from our troubles and trials. We praise you today for everything you have done for us, but most of all, for your son Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again for our salvation. This morning, Lord, we want you to cleanse us from all our sinful thoughts, our selfishness, our dishonesty, and our ungratefulness, so that we can experience a revival of godliness, righteousness, righteousness and holiness in our heart through this worship service. We lift up our congregation to your mighty hands today. We all come with our own unique life situations and needs, but you know us individually and invite us to bring everything to you in prayer. We pray for many different kinds of physical needs, financial needs. There are those with the emotional needs. Some need the healings of relationships. Whatever they are, Lord, we bring them to you with faith. We pray for our community and our government officials, our retirees, contractors, service members, and their family, families. We pray for Chaplain Hibbebrand this morning as he delivers your living words to us. Please pour your spirit on him so that his words have power to change us, to empower us with your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as you forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This time, youth are dismissed to uh, to service. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter five, verses three through twelve. And that can be found on page 949 of your pew Bibles and also on the overhead behind me. So if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Um, I forgot to mention that we are going to try uh, in the future um, to... If you're, if you're interested in helping um, some soldiers who are living in the barracks on the other side of post to get to uh, CHAP, to Common Ground. And so I'm hoping that some of you will, will be willing to use your vehicles to uh, bring, bring some soldiers and then also take them, take them back and maybe even uh, invite them out to lunch. Uh, take them farther, farther out of Humphreys than they normally get to go if they don't have a vehicle. You know, take them someplace like that and just love on them uh, from afar uh, or close by. So uh, we're going to be doing that, I think. So I, I, who, was, who was the point guy? Was somebody you were going to be? Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll formulate that plan in a little bit and we'll lay it out and then he'll come in and talk to you about how we're going to accomplish that task. But just put that in the back of your mind. Be willing to maybe do that for, for some of our single soldiers that are in here uh, that, that need help for that. Um, I normally don't begin with a prayer, but I think I'm going to pray uh, for, uh, on, this, on this text here before we get into it. So let us, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, I'm thankful that you are our God. I'm thankful that 
Uh, you uh, are in charge. I'm thankful that you rose Christ again from uh, the dead. Uh, I'm thankful that you uh, have included us as your children and being a part of your inheritance. God, help me to deal with this text in a, a way that, that is wise. Uh, help me to speak truth uh, into places where we need that. Uh, God, may I not be um, angry in my sin uh, or be angry in sin, I guess maybe I should say in terms of that. Uh, may your, your goodness and your grace and your mercy uh, and your truth come through uh, your holy word today. We ask these things in your son's holy name. Amen. We've been working our way through Ephesians, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about that as our identity, like who we are in Christ is really important to Paul, especially in Ephesians, right? And, uh, and you're like, you should be able to rattle them off by now, by the time I, I get finished with Ephesians, right? You, you've been elected, you've been adopted, you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, uh, you're part of God's inheritance, right? You've, you've been uh, taken, uh, you have an old life, you now have a new life, you're a new creation in Christ, uh, you have good works to walk in uh, that God is calling you to, you're his, his masterpiece, right? You, you have left the old life and you're now living this new life. And you're like, well, what is this new life I'm supposed to be living? If I'm a believer in Christ, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? And we finally have gotten into the, well, what is it we are supposed to be doing then if I claim to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus? or a believer in the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's kind of where we're at. And Paul has spent, uh, uh, we've spent several weeks now talking about more of the positive things. What does that look like? Well, you're supposed to treat one another with kindness, with patience, with long-suffering, right? For the sake of the unity, it, uh, taking, taking the bad that other people are giving you and giving them much grace and, and, and kindness in return. Because uh, that's part of who we are, because that's what Christ has done for us. Uh, in, in the beginning of chapter 5, he says, uh, walk uh, like Christ did, right? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. We are supposed to be self-sacrificing individuals, caring about the needs and the desires of other people more than ourselves. That we are called to do that. And, and a couple Sundays ago, I said, you know, as we move into the imperatives, things that we must do as believers in Christ, you have to kind of slow down a little bit and, and not point fingers at other, other people and at first examine your own heart because these texts are for, for you first before you can start removing the little sliver in somebody else's eye. You have to take the plank out of your own, right? I did say, uh, Jesus didn't say never take the, the, the sliver out of somebody else's eye, but he said you better have yours taken out first. So uh, the first instance, as we begin to read this about sexual purity, uh, it should be turned inward to your own heart and go, well, what is happening in the inner chambers of my inner being? What happens in the inner being of my mind first? And what are the actions I'm actually producing? What is coming out of my mouth and the things that I, that I talk? Paul puts a huge emphasis on the things that are coming out of us. Out of, the, out of the speech. And Jesus says the same thing, right? He says, it's not what goes in that makes you unclean, but it's everything that, that pours forth outward. And so a big portion of this text talks about talking, crude joking, uh, being foolish, having foolish talk that's wrapped in around in some kind of sexualness. So we're going to get into that. Um, but I want you to first examine yourselves in that. I have, I have three things, three points that are coming out of the text. So if you're a note taker, I, I, on purpose, I didn't have any slides because I kind of want you to be looking in the text and, and just listening to, to the, the, the voice. Hopefully, uh, God is speaking through me in this. Um, but if you are taking notes, and I'll, I'll list them all for you now. I normally just keep them to myself until the end. Uh, but some people are like, I, you sometimes don't finish. So let me give you my three points so you can pull them out. I'm going to say, how, how, can we, how are we to walk in love? How are we to walk in love? And in this passage, there are three imperatives. I'm going to go cover verses 3 through 6 this, this, uh, today. And I may decide tomorrow, uh, next Sunday is Reformation Sunday, so I may break off and do a little bit of why we are Protestants uh, and, and not Catholic. Uh, because I mean, those, are, those are important pieces too. But I may can just continue on in the text and, and cover 7 through, through 12 at the end. I'm still wrestling with that, and hopefully the Lord will give me the right, the right choice uh, in that particular one. So, but verses 3 through 6, there are three imperatives. 
and they kind of follow along with, with my points here. The first one is going to be how we should walk as, as Christians, how should we walk in love. The first is purity, right? We are supposed to, to live a life of purity. The second one is we're to live a life of knowledge. And then the third one is we're supposed to live a life of truth. So purity, knowledge, and truth. Those are, those are my, my section headings. All right, so we begin with, with a, life, uh, a life of purity. Um, sex is an amazing gift of God. It is something that, that the Bible clearly says is, is not just for procreation. It is, it is for something more than just that. It's between a husband and a wife. The Bible is very clear on when sex can be wielded and what kind of gift it should use. If you've never read the Song of Solomon, uh, know that it's an awesome book about two people that are loving on each other and they're loving on each other in all sorts of ways. That may make you blush if you've never read it before or if you don't understand some of the metaphors. I know it's a little weird. She's like the, her, the beauty. He describes what, some of the beauty of her. You know, she has like this long neck and a little pot belly. And Anyway, it's, it's a fascinating read of the type of beauty, how beauty changes over time. But there are two, two people that are, that are going to become married through that whole thing and they are enjoying each other's bodies. And that is, God, God intended sex for more than just procreation, just pushing out babies, right? I, it is for something else. Uh, I think there's, there's a, a, a good argument you could make that pleasure in sex is, is awesome, all right? So if I know young people, you're out there. I did put a warning out before that this is a little bit more mature than I normally have. Uh, but I'm telling you, sex is great. And it should be. And if it's not for you, then there's probably some reason behind that, whether there's some sexual trauma in your past. I'm also a, a therapist, so I, that's also in the back of my mind as I, as I preach up in here. Um, so I know that, and this is no way, I, I'm, I hope it doesn't come across as attacking you if you find yourself trapped in that, where sex is not pleasurable between you, uh, your husband, or your wife. But I, I hope that that never becomes the case where you, you stop enjoying each other's bodies, because God has given you that as a gift. And I think because of that, Satan goes after that more than anything else to pervert it into something that's not pure. When, when God gave Adam Eve, right, and they became one, before the, even the fall of humanity, they were having sex with each other. How cool is that? Right? It's a gift of God for a husband and a wife. Uh, it's the one type of love that you don't share with anybody else. I can agape love everybody. I can friendship love everybody, but there's only one person I can share sexual intimacy with, and that is my, that is my wife. And it's, that's, it's how important that is for just us as a Christians to remember, because he's going to say the, the antidote to a life of non-purity, the life, the antidote is to be thankful. He doesn't go, he doesn't say, here's all the unrighteousness that, that we can get ourselves trapped into, and then, so what we should do then is live this life of, of morality. If immorality is something we should, he doesn't say that. He says, I want you to live a life of thanksgiving. So thanksgiving is the antidote. If you're struggling with, with sexual issues and problems, thanksgiving is the answer to that. If you're, if you're addicted to pornography in some way, uh, thanksgiving is a... A cure for that. This is the, what Paul lays out here in this passage, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, on a, another note, every time I, I ran through this sermon, it, it came out differently each and every time as I was going. So I'm going to just trust that God is, is going to direct me in this. I have my anchor points, but it kept coming out differently. I, I, could, I could go through this passage and, and walk over each one of these words for you. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, uh, foolish talk, crude joking, filthiness, right? I, I could tell you what the Greek words are and try to, to get a, a better context, but I think you can just, you kind of know uh, what generally, what purity means in a lot of ways. Uh, there's not a lot of nuance that Paul is putting into this. He's like, there is a right way to think about sex and, and do sex, and there is a, definitely a, a wrong way. And so maybe that wouldn't be as helpful to you. So I kind of, I hesitate to kind of just go, and the Greek word for... Uh, because ultimately then, uh, it, I may be looking for loopholes around the whole, I am supposed to maintain purity in the midst, in the midst of everything that I, that I do. 
Now, I know statistically speaking wise, if I'm going to move into to some pornography issues here, uh, statistically speaking, uh, there's many of us in this room today uh, that have actively engaged in pornography this past week. And, and I think the, the and I'm going to get to some of that, but I just, I just have to, to realize that it's not just men, okay? So men, I think, we're, think I'm going to be talking to you. 40% of pornography users are women. And that may surprise you in that, but it shouldn't. It may look differently. But we're after, we're chasing after something in a way that God uh, is not honored by. And I think one of the issues that you're talking, you're trying to, you're a witness to Christ, for your, to your friends and to your neighbors and to your fellow soldiers, and you're like, hey, uh, Christ can change your life. And they're like, well, what's different between you and me? Right? You watch Game of Thrones, I watch Game of Thrones. You have an only friends, uh, OnlyFans account, I have an OnlyFans account. What's the difference? Oh, you, you go every other week because you feel guilty on one of those weeks, but then you go right back to the vomit. But is there any difference between me and you? And sometimes the answer is going to be, no, there's not a difference between me and you. I, I, I have other piousness, like I try to love other people maybe in a little bit, a little bit greater nature than that. But at the fundamental level, I am, uh, I am still not walking in purity. I am corrupt. And Paul just goes on to say that if you're corrupt, if you're not pure, right? He says... For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is, who is covetous, and we'll cover why greediness is in this, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a weighty statement. If you are sexually impure, you do not have any inheritance. And that's a big, that should be a big deal because we just learned earlier on, right, that as a believer, if you are in Christ, you are God's inheritance. You are God's inheritance. He's, you're a portion of his. And so now Paul is saying, like, if you are, if you are walking in, in impurity, you are not part of that inheritance, which means you are not sealed by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is not in you and you're not sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are fooling yourself into considering yourself a believer in Christ. I'm just gonna, I know that's, that may be really heavy. And I'll just let that sit there, I, I kinda, and I want it to be heavy. Because this, is, this warning is not just a flippant thing that Paul is throwing out there. It's not just in Ephesians. All right? you, can, you can turn one book to the left in Galatians, right towards the end. Um, chapter 5, verse 19. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Number one, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. So the first four things cover like almost any kind of sexualness that you could, you could imagine. Pick one, and it's probably covered in those four words. Uh, sorcery, enmity, strife, just in case, you're, just in case you feel like you're, you're like, the sex talk I don't need because I'm, I'm super pure, chaplain. I'm purer than the snow is, is white. Um, he's going to throw some other ones in here just so we can put it up. Strife, jealousy, fits of ang anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's not the whole list of things, of living your life unpure and not like you, are, you belong to the family of God. Because the things that you do, right, I've said, we've said this time and time again, my behavior determines my fraternity. Who your father is is determined by who, uh, what you do and what you say. If you tell me you are for Christ, you tell me that you love Jesus, and your life looks nothing like it, there is no evidence whatsoever, then you don't, you don't know who the Father is. Jesus says, how do you know that you're my disciple? As if you obey the things that I tell you to do. That's my paraphrase. Here's, here's, the, here's another. First John, uh, go into chapter 3. It says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. For you know that he appeared in order to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning either has seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices unrighteousness, uh, whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous. But whoever practices sin is full of deceit, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. 
And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But it is this evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. You have your father, the devil, or you have father, uh, the father, God. Like, that's the Bible gives you that. I know you're like, well, I don't like dichotomies in that way. Those are my two choices. If the Bible is real, those are the two choices that we have in front of us. I either do the things that my father, the devil, does, and I'm a liar, or I do the things that God, my father, is, and I live a life of righteousness and purity. Now, I started with that sex is awesome. Right? And I think this is where this thankfulness piece really needs to come in and, and be known. That if I am really thankful that the one place that I get to experience awesome sex is with my wife, then I can be thankful to God that he has provided a way to meet one of the needs that I have. And sex is an emotional need. It's not just a physical one. It's an emotional need. Some have more of that a need than others. But you are two together, and I hope that you have great conversations about it. Right? The Bible says, uh, in uh, Paul again in Corinthians, he's talking about sex. He goes, he goes men, do you not know that your, your bodies don't belong to you? They belong to your wife. Wife, do you not know your body doesn't belong to you? It belongs to your husband. And that the two of you should be enjoying sex together. And the only time that you shouldn't be having sex is if you're going to pray. And that's only for a short amount of time. And then get back together again. Because bad things happen if you're not. Right? That's, you can read that in 1 Corinthians. If you don't believe me, it's in there. So, husband, why do you think your wife will get, gets upset when you click on the computer late at night or you're on your phone somewhere else and you're clicking on something else and you're sharing some kind of sexual love with an image on a screen, a person who doesn't love you, who doesn't know you. I know it's less messy, right? That you don't have to smell whoever's on the screen. You don't get to do that. You don't have to live with that individual and that person, but you are sharing a love with somebody else through that screen that doesn't belong to you and your body is not your own. Your wife owns you. And a person that is thankful for God, thankful to your wife, is not going to be somebody who's going to be clicking on that and looking at those types of things and fulfilling yourself sexually in that way because you're not thankful. You're an idolater because you only care about yourself. Don't, don't bother coming and telling me that you love your wife, men. Don't bother telling me that you love your wife while you're, while you're messing around with somebody else, whether really in person or on a screen. The Bible doesn't give us that option. Don't tell me that because that's a lie from the pit of hell. You are a selfish individual and you need to repent. And that's not just for the men. Right? I'll come make off to the wives. Wives, you don't own your body either. You can't be sharing yourself with somebody on a screen or in a book or watching, or watching some, some romance novel and wanting your husband to be like some romantic guy that, that you watched on there and you dream about that and that's the thing that you lust over, okay? And, and I, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your husband. And that's why you guys need to have some great communication because you're also greedy. That's why Paul throws this covetousness in this whole, this whole thing. It has to do with you. Everything's about you. My sexuality's about me. You can go, when you go on a deployment, you got a soldier, doesn't matter who it is, male or female, doesn't it? you sit around, you're like, oh, I can't have sex anymore. Oh, I really need some sex right now. And you think only about yourself and not about what's back home waiting for you there. Now, if you're single in here, you're like, man, he's going after like married couples. What about me? I, I'm going to get to you. Okay? I'm going to get to you. I hope I, I'm hoping I'm not sounding as angry as I, I feel. Up here. I'm not, that's not my intent. All right? It could be because a lot of the people that I see and deal with from a therapy standpoint are trapped in this. And I, don't want, I want to spare you the heartache and pain that is required to build back bridges and repair. Is it possible? Yes. Can you regain trust after, after some horrible things have happened and you've shared love with somebody that you shouldn't have? Yes, there is redemption for you. And we're going to get there. But this passage should weigh very heavy on you because God is calling you to a life of purity. Now, if you're, if you're a single person, you're like, well, what about me? The Bible gives you no other option to have sex besides to get married. 
Uh, the cool thing about being single is you don't have to worry about anything. You can focus solely on the gospel, so get, focus solely on making disciples in your life. If, if there was a Bible study on a Monday night, you know what? You could do it. Because you don't have to call the phone and be like, hey, hey, wife of mine, what are you and the kids doing on Monday night? Can I spend another night doing some Bible study stuff? That, you have to worry about that when you're married. Paul says it, right? If you're married, you're going to have trouble. You are, you're a, you're half of you is in the world and half of you is in heaven. And Paul says, I'd rather you be like me, unmarried and like focused solely on the gospel presentation of Jesus Christ. You know, I hope that for everybody. And so one of the questions for you should be, how come there's not a whole lot of single people in ministry on the Protestant side? Because we should have that. What a great opportunity. Don't waste it chasing after things that the Bible says aren't for you yet. Are you, have, are you thankful for your singleness? Oftentimes, I think we, we equate uh, sexualness as closeness. That I'm, and that's true. God, I'll never be closer to my wife than after we've had sex. I feel really loved by her after we've snuggled and done all the things and had, enjoyed each other's bodies. I feel close to her at that particular point. But that is not the only way to feel close to somebody. And we lie to ourselves and say, I'm all alone if I'm, not, if I'm not engaged in sexual activity. That's a lie. Single person that's in here. You should be thankful for your singleness. Be thankful for your sexuality. Again, I'm not saying that it's bad. Like, it's, it's difficult. I can't imagine being single. It's, it's been so long ago. I can't imagine that, that I don't have an opportunity you know, when I, when, I, when I need some sex, I call my wife up and say, it's, it's go time. She may say, can I wait? And then we'll discuss it, okay? But, so I know it's difficult. I want to say that it's not, it's not difficult for you. But there's a right way to, to, to honor God. God is calling you to a life of purity. And how cool it is when you finally meet the person that you're supposed to marry and you walk down the aisle. And you share love with them that you're not supposed to share with anybody else. And there's no one else, no one else for you to compare that to. I, I've not had sex with any other woman besides my wife. I have no idea what, what, what I can compare her to other than nothing. And that's awesome. Because it's hard to get that back. But that wasn't the case for you. Protect your purity. And how do you do that? Again, I go back to this Thanksgiving piece. He doesn't say do other things. He says be thankful. Be thankful to God for the position that you're in, to the person that you're married to, to the life circumstance that you're in. If I'm deployed and I'm away from my spouse, I'm thankful that I have this separation and this time. I know that sounds really bizarre. Thankful for that separation and a time now I can, I can focus a lot on, on ministry stuff. There's a lot of opportunities when you're deployed to do things. Uh, if you're separated, you're in the field, be thankful you're over there. That's part of the job that you're in, right? If you're back home, be thankful that your spouse is away. Now you have opportunity to do something that you wouldn't be able to, right? I, find whatever thankfulness. I don't know what it is. There's all sorts of things I could probably run off the list off the top of my head. But you have to be thankful. If you're stuck on pornography, what is it? You have to be thankful for yourself. Oftentimes, people that are stuck in pornography, they, just, they dislike themselves in a lot of ways. It's not just about sex, and I know that, okay? I'm, 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 I, I, it's not one of those you're like, well, just stop it, right? If that was the case, therapy would be really easy. If I could just sit, whoever comes through my door, and I sit them down, and they're like, hey, chaplain, uh, you know, I eat too much ice cream. Well, stop it. That'll be $5, right? And then I send them out on their way. I, I, I get that there's underlying issues that we're going to have to deal with of pornography, but the Bible does begin with, stop it. Why? Because no one who is like this has the kingdom of God in them. That's a, that's a, tough, that's a tough one. We're going to come to that. Uh, so let me move off. That's the purity one. And I'm going to be, I'm, I'm running out of time. I know. Okay. The second, how should we walk, how should Christian walks? Purity. Purity. We're called to that. There's so many lists in the Bible that talk about purity, 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 purity. 
And you do that with thanksgiving. It's, it, and if you're struggling with purity right now, you, you need to increase your thanksgiving for your situation and the circumstance you find yourself in. And it's difficult, but you are called to deny yourself. Because in the end, it is worth it. In the end, it is worth it. Pick up your cross, deny yourself. We are called to do that as Christians. All right, the second thing is, so knowledge. You're like, where am I, where am I, getting, where am I getting that? Uh, in verse 5 it says, for you may be sure of this. So that's the command. You may be sure of this. No knowing. That's why it's not literally translated that way in the Greek. Because otherwise, no knowing is kind of strange. You could have said, um, one person was like, take it to the bank. That's an idiot. Like, it's going to happen. For sure, for sure. Uh, uh, Till hell freezes over, this is going to be true. Right? This is a, a statement of, you can know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, there's the knowledge that has to come with this, that, that everyone who is sexually immoral or pure or who is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He is not saying, you know, sometimes. He's just saying, know this. This is the, this is the rules. And I read, you, I read you 1 John, I read you Galatians, there's that list. Um, if you turn over just one page or two, depending on your, on your Bible, in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, uh, in chapter 4, uh, in 17, he says, Now I say this and testify on the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Right? They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned in Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught him as the truth that is in Jesus. So Paul continuously throughout Ephesians talks about the knowledge. Do you know who God is? Do you know what God has said? Do you know what the, the truth is? We'll, we'll get to truth the next the next piece here. But do you know what God has said about this particular topic? Is your mind skewed about what sex is and what it's for? And how great it can be. But how, how, how dangerous it can also be. And how damaging it is. And that God is serious. When he says, if you're doing these things, you are not part of the inheritance. Now you're like, well, what is that? Does that mean, Chaplain, that I'm out? If I, if I, I stumble across, uh, not even purposely, I stumble across something on the internet and I fall down a dark hole. Because I, I, that's believable to me. There's lots of dark pits. The Bible says that the, the, the mouth of an adulterous woman is an open pit, and those who are cursed of God fall into it. All right? Satan is looking to kick you in to a pit. That's why you always have to be on the guard. You can never let your, let your guard down, because there's, there's pits all over the place. But... Was I going with that? That totally just that imagery distracted me. So if you're you're wind your, you find yourself you're saying you're on the internet and uh, something bad happens, right? Um, if if you're on Tinder, something bad is going to happen. Okay, so you might as well if you're a believer in Christ, you might as well just get off that right now. If you have an OnlyFans account, you may want to just close that out right now because there is nothing good on any of those those websites or those apps right now. I don't care how much you're going to try to convince me it's only for uh, for educational purposes or whatever it is. I'm just trying to teach unbelievers about Jesus, you need to stop, okay? Well, what if happens if you do, you, you fall over and, and then you sin, does that mean I'm out? Sometimes the Bible feels like that's what it says, and it leaves you there. Because I think we have, a, we have a misunderstanding of justification. Often, right, Paul, it, we read Romans chapter 8, uh, John, and I, that was really cool. I didn't coordinate that with you at all. Uh, but because it leaves us with, like, there's, that's in chapter 8, where we're like, well, then nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, right? So I can just continue to sin and do whatever I want because Christ loves me. Well, in chapter 6, Paul's, Paul goes, okay, so you think you understand grace. So the more I sin, right, Paul, the more God's grace abounds. That's correct. So, Paul, what you're telling me then is if I sin more 
then God's grace I get more of, then that's a good thing, right? More of God's grace is good? Look like that would be, yeah. Well, then I should sin as much as I possibly can because I want more of God's grace. And Paul's like, no, that is not true whatsoever. Absolutely not. If that's your thinking, your, your mind has not been enlightened yet. You do not have knowledge of who God is. So that's, that's chapter 6. Chapter 7 kicks in in Romans. Chapter 7, he talks about, I, I know what I should do, but I can't do it. I do the things I don't want to do, and I struggle with life, and life is hard, and I don't follow God, but I want to follow God. And, it's, you know, and there's a struggle in Romans chapter 7, and there's no necessarily an answer, because that, that's true, okay? So I can't sin for God's grace to abound, even though when I do, God's grace does abound. I can't, I can't, sometimes I do the things I don't want to do. I'm being pushed for that. And then Romans chapter 8 comes along and says that God's grace is there for me in the midst of that. And there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And the passage right before the one that he just read talks about justification and sanctification. And I think we always drop the sanctification piece off of this. So if I'm in Christ Jesus, not only am I justified, this is true. And justification just means like God, Jesus' uh, righteousness is imputed to me. And those are just fancy words to say that his right, Christ's righteousness, when God looks at me, he doesn't look at my own filthy rags. He sees Jesus, right? Because I'm now, I'm now a child of God. I've been adopted. And he overlays everything that's good about Jesus, he overlays it onto my own, to my own soul and self. And so when God the Father looks at me, I am perfect and holy before the Father. That's Ephesians chapter 1 that we cover. It. Sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus each and every day. And the Bible says that I've been justified. I've been justified, but I've also, it says, those whom he justifies, he also sanctifies. I can't live a life apart from justification and sanctification because they go together. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus each and every day. And I have to know that each and every day. So don't get confused. You're like, well, if I sin, how, when, when, how much sin is too much sin? It's a terrible question to ask. Because you know that God is calling you to purity. Any sin is too much sin. That's why Jesus had to die. And so you should treat it as such. It's an invasion. It's a th something that should not be because it's messing your relationships up uh, across the board, this uh, horizontally to the people to your left and to your right, and it's messing your relationship up with God. You have to be knowledgeable about that. You're like, you still haven't answered my question, Javelin. How, how often can I look at pornography and not lose my salvation? That's what I really want to know. How many times can I cheat on my spouse and still be a believer in Christ. Well, I'm not going to tell you that number. That's something that's going to have to weigh upon your own heart, and I want you to struggle with that, uh, because the warnings of Scripture are very clear, and they're there for a reason. That's a, that's a conversation between you and God. So I'll let you know that God is calling you to a life of purity, and know that anyone who practices these things has no inheritance in the kingdom of God of Christ. Kingdom of Christ and of God. So what does that lead us? It goes back to the truth piece. All right, that's my third, my third point. You're like, Javelin is 12. Yeah, I know, okay. Um, the truth, and the truth is this. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. God's wrath is real. His holiness is real. Why does he get so angry? People are like, why do, you, why do you think God gets so angry about sexual immorality? Because it messes up your relationship to him. Think, think about what the first thing, the first thing that Adam and, did, Adam and Eve did when they sinned. What did they do? They covered themselves. Because they were ashamed for the first time of their life. Their beautiful naked bodies, their sexuality had been perverted. And now they could no longer stand before God unashamed and unafraid of, of who they were, even though he was their creator. Sexual sin makes us ashamed to stand before a holy God. And so God hates it. And with impunity, he's going to come to judge the world because of it. Now, he lists all sorts of other sins other places. So that's not just for that. 
but it says God's wrath is coming. And anybody who says, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's not true. You can do what you want with your body. You're still good to go in the spirit. Paul, Paul had the same people in his day. There were people that said that a person's spirit, their immaterial part of them was the most holy part, and it was uncorruptible. You could, you, that, that one was number one, and my, your body was just like this lump of clay that you could do whatever you wanted with it. You could have sex with whoever you wanted to. You could share your body with whatever you wanted to do. Do whatever you want with your body, but it's who you are on the inside, your immaterial part of you that matters the most. It's number one, and it's untouchable from your corrupted body. The Bible comes along and says, no, God made you your body and your spirit are one and they're together. So if you sin in your body, your spirit is now sin. If you sin in your spirit, your body is now sin. It's they're together. And when we die, God, your, your physical body kicks over, your spiritual body leaves, and, he, and God does what? He sticks you in a new body because we're, we're not supposed to be separate from that. Part of the reason we go, to, we go into heaven is so that our body that does break down no longer does and we can live eternally with him in Christ. But judgment is coming. And so we have to live in that truth and know that the only way we can avoid that is through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for our sins. He's offering redemption today. Forgiveness is for you today. If you're like, man, I failed a whole lot. I have a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in my past. There's a lot of stuff that has happened, things my spouse doesn't even know about. And if that ever got out, it would be really, really, really bad. I know Jesus died for that too. And he's offering grace and mercy and forgiveness for you today, right now. You can repent. And I believe if the church would just repent from their sexual immorality, we would change all sorts of things about our society. Because if we look no different sexually than anybody on the outside, is there really any difference? They can love. They can do good things. They can have good parties. They can eat, they can eat fried chicken just as well as I can. But something that they can't do because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, and that is live a life of purity. God's grace not only saves you from sin, God's grace empowers you to live the life God is calling you to. So if you're trapped in sexual sin right now, the first thing is to, to just cry out to God for repentance. And the second thing that you have to do is cry out to God for repentance. And the third thing is you cry out to God for repentance and you begin to live your life with thanksgiving. And God gave you the body of Christ here. What was the passage that we just read earlier in, in chapter 4? That we're supposed to, to, to love on one another uh, with, with much patience and loving kindness. We, we, we help each other. It's not my job to shame you out of your pornography. It's not my job to shame you out of your adultery. It's not my job to shame you out of your uh, using your singleness as just a free lot to, to have sex with whoever you want. I'm not trying to shame you out of that. You, you can bring your own shame as much as you want with that. If the Holy Spirit's in you, it's going to be there because God disciplines those he loves. It's your job to respond to that, to repent. And I'm going to love on you and try to and, and do what I can to encourage you and walk you through. Maybe you have trauma in your past that's causing you to do some of those things. Let me help you get through some of that. Right? I'm not going to try to, I'm not trying to judge you because God is going to. And he's going to do it more righteously and better than ever I could. But I don't want you to die either. I want you to be part of the inheritance. God is calling you to a life of, of purity. God is calling you to a life of knowledge, and God is calling you to a life of truth. Um, that last, the last command there is, is do, not be, do not be deceived. That Paul says, be commanded. Do not be deceived. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, thank you for your word. We thank you for your text. I um, I, pr I pray for those who, who are who are struggling in here, God. That on one on one hand they feel the pull of culture and the way that culture says that sex is supposed to be, uh, and they've made it something that it's not. And so, God, I pray that you would empower them uh, to live a life of purity. Now, to those of uh, to those of us in here who are living a life of purity now, God, I, I pray for their protection that they would never let their guard down, um, 
because Satan is roaming this world like an angry lion seeking who he may devour. God, may we humble ourselves before you. Jesus, I know you, you said that you experienced all our, all our temptations that we had, and yet uh, you maintained um, your purity and so that you now can sympathize with us and empathize with us, and so I appeal to that. Holy Spirit, I, I pray that you empower each one in here today to live that life. May they feel the power, not of timidity, but of, but of power. To live a life of purity, so that their walk looks like their talk, and truly be somebody different. Anyway, I ask these things in your holy name. Amen. I think I'm going to skip our last hymn. And we'll jump right to our benediction. So please stand for the, the benediction. The Lord bless thee, and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance, his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brothers and sisters, know that Christ offers a sacrifice for you that covers all of your unrighteousness. And he's here not just to take away your guilt, but your shame. Today is the day that you can repent. Today is the day you can begin to live a life of purity. And it will be like your sin never happened. In the name of the Father, I send you to go. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love each other as yourself. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.